I got a little long in my previous video about Paul Reddick. I knew that I would, even though I've got notes here, I didn't stick to them and I kind of tend to ramble, but I knew I was gonna to have to do this in at least two parts. So let me uh, resume with some other subjects. And again, I wanna start off by repeating that I have the utmost respect for Paul Reddick as a coach and as a man. I think the things that he's said and done about tournament baseball, somebody desperately needed to, to say, uh, I've seen so many kids, so have you probably, who their arms are ready for the knife by the time they're 11 or 12 because the coaches just want another trophy from another tournament. And the poor kid gets run out there. Of course, tournaments now have uh, pitching limits, most of them, but it's not even a matter of pitching limit. If you're, you're out there with the crappy infield behind you that <laughs> so many, I'm sorry, I'm talking like a dad, but I've seen this so often. You have fielders behind your pitcher who just can't make an out. So the poor pitcher's out there throwing ground balls, and he's out there for 40 pitches in the hot summer sun. He goes in, it's three up and three down. He's back there on the mound in five minutes, and now it's 41, 42. It doesn't matter if he has a pitching limit. His arm is just getting beat up too much and too small a window of time. Now, Paul Reddick has addressed this subject, and I just can't say enough good things about him for doing that. I'm so grateful to him as a dad and as a human being for doing that. But his, it's his uh, claims about hitting instruction, and again, these are often claims that reflect what the broader coaching community seems to be saying. These are things that I want to address. Um, he certainly didn't endear himself to most coaches when he attacked the hitting tee. Uh, a lot of professionals, probably most, if not all, professional ball players hit off the tee to this day. Uh, he also, Paul Reddick, uh, has said some disparaging things about pitching machines. And again, I don't actually disagree with these comments. Probably more than 50% of what I feel is agreement. But I wish that he wouldn't state things in such a uh, almost belligerent, antagonistic, either this or that, never do this, always do this, never use a hitting tee. Why are you using a hitting tee? You're not playing golf. The ball's not stationary, is it? You should only hit off of live pitching. Why are you using a pitching machine? That's not a person. Um, let's, let's slow down. I don't even have a tea anymore. Uh, I could do this video outside with a tea as a demonstration, but I don't, I don't have, I haven't hit off a tea for a couple of years. Uh, I began hitting off a tea when I was trying to explore this, uh, some of the fine points of this old school swing that I'm really into. You know why I did that was because I wanted to uh, see how a ball would travel if it was a low outside pitch. What could I do with that using this swing where I try to achieve a 100% forward weight transfer and try to swing straight into the ball, hit it center, a little bit downward. Um, how's the ball going to react to that? I'm hoping that it's going to go to the opposite field on a low trajectory. Uh, many times what I would find out on the tee is that I couldn't get it on a low trajectory. And that was frustrating. I would set up the tee very high and inside, too, to see what I could do with that. I would, you know, I'd set the tee up all over the place. Now, I wasn't hitting, and this will sound crazy to some of you, but I wasn't hitting the ball as it sat there on the tee, I was hitting a ball that I saw in my mind's eye. I was imagining a pitcher out there coming set, going into his wind up, releasing the ball. I guess he's coming set, he's not winding up, I know. But he's, I'm, I'm imagining all of the motions that he's going through and I'm trying to uh, prepare for everything he's doing with my body and I'm going into my load and all that. And then I'm actually not even seeing the ball that I hit off the tee. I'm imagining that it's a low outside pitch because you know, it, they say it's the ball by the time it's like, what, halfway to the plate, two thirds to the plate, 
you can just close your eyes, except you don't even have time to do that. But it's the decision that your mind has made to swing or not to swing, where to aim to swing, all of those motor decisions, those uh, the, all of the neurons that need to be ignited have, have been ignited. The buttons have been pushed by that time. You can't, you know, following the ball all the way to the tee. Walt Reniak used to have his guys look the ball all the way into the net. Well, that's, that's really kind of pointless because in that final part of the ball's transit, you're not getting any information that you can use. So believe it or not, I was actually hitting the ball off the tee without seeing the ball. I was going into my swing when the imaginary ball was well toward the plate, but, but not right in front of the plate. And uh, I don't know if kids nowadays would be able to do that because so many of you are raised with a, a smartphone or some kind of screen in front of you when you're goo-gooing in the crib. So I'm afraid that that doesn't allow young people today to develop the kind of imagination that it would take to actually have a, a sort of a session in the cage while they're in the den or while they're just you know, using their imagination swinging off of pitches. But I don't, uh, I'm a big believer in that. I think you should, if you're gonna use a tee, you should use it in that manner, use it imaginatively. Same thing for pitching machines. Um, Practically any pitching machine is going to have some kind of quirky little thing. You know, the old pitching machines literally had an arm that would load up and they were they might be gas powered. When I was a kid, even older pitching machines, they would actually have a spring. And I've seen video of guys, you know, they'd, they'd load the thing up and then they'd have a catch or release that they'd hit with their foot. And Hitter would, you would see the catapult being released, uh, trebuchet, I think it's called. And you're, you're actually hitting off of a projectile released by trebuchet. Well, whatever you're, and then nowadays the machines are much more sophisticated, but they'll often give a little light, have one that blinks a little green light sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't always observe the same uh, time interval as it's supposed to. Uh, that's another point that I'll come to in a minute, but they'll, they'll be giving you little tips that you should be able to associate with stations in the pitcher's uh, delivery. And, you know, you, as you're looking at the machine, associate the machine's motions with a human being's motions. And in, in that respect, it's as good as, in some ways, better than practicing off of a living human being. Some kids, you try to get them to throw batting practice and they don't really feel like it or they're just not, they're just kind of lobbing it in there or their attention is distracted and they're carrying on a conversation with someone else. That can be really annoying and, and not very helpful, I think. Um, a pitching machine will, of course, you can get as close to it as you want. It can throw you some really hard pitches. Now, it, it is certainly true as Coach Reddick maintains, that if the only thing you're learning how to do is hit really fast pitching, fast and straight pitching, you're not learning how to hit a pitch that has some kind of wrinkle in it. Uh, you're not learning how to hit a, a pitch that's slower. Uh, usually they come to just one spot in the strike zone. That's why I like my beat up old pitching machine. It actually throws these little golf sized wiffle balls and I keep all those old balls even when they develop cracks because not only does the, the whiffle effect and the wind make them move, but the cracks make them move all over the place, sometimes way out of the strike zone. And I know when I'm going well on that machine, when I can hold my swing back. That's another thing. If you have a pitching machine that's just grooving ball after ball, you can cheat. You know, you can start early because you know where it's going to be. It's going to be in the very same place as the last pitch. But when you have an erratic machine like mine, and I think there are uh, top-end machines now that can be programmed so that they deliberately do what my poor old machine is just kind of accidentally doing. But you can 
find a machine that will vary speed and kind of pitch, sure, that's the kind of machine that you want. The, the, you, you, you know you're going well when you can hold up on a pitch that turns out not to be in the strike zone. And that is good batting practice, I agree. That's what you'd like, and even from live pitching, you'd like your pitcher to throw you some stuff that's out of the zone once in a while, maybe even a brush back pitch to practice and see, make sure you can get out of the way. They should be mixed up. But you can, even that, you can do that in your den as long as you're not going to break a chandelier or something. But if you've got a good imagination, you can imagine pitches coming in all over the place at all different speeds. For crying out loud, why wouldn't you do that with, why do you, why, why does Coach Reddick say never take, he seems like he's saying never take practice swings. Why wouldn't you do that as much as you can if you've got an imagination? So try to cultivate your imagination because hitting is really, uh, I think he'd probably agree with this. It's, it's a kind of an idea. It's, you, you, here's my barrel. There's the ball. I want the barrel to enter the center of the ball. I personally, because of my method, want it to be coming slightly downward. I don't really care if I get a little top spin, but I want hard contact. Um, I can, with imagination, put my body through the motions that I want it to know so well that it doesn't have to think about doing them. And I can do that without facing a machine or, or without using a hitting tee. But if I use one of these supplemental devices, I would like to enlist them in the imaginative exercise. I want to use all of those things uh, in a game that I created with my imagination. And the game that I've created is, is the live game of baseball. Okay? I hope that makes sense. That's what we're going for here.